A graphic novel, a TV show. Well, it's not TV, it's HBO. And will this thing succeed? And by how much, man? And some might cheer and some might scoff because it's Damon Lindelof. But either way, we're off to watch some Watchmen. Watching Watchmen. Talking Watchmen. Analyzing Watchmen. And maybe arguing over Watch. Who watches Watchmen? We watch Watchmen. We just watched it. You just watched it. And now we're going to watch a podcast, which is a thing you cannot do. This is Watchmen Watch, and I'm Alex. I'm Justin. And we are going to be talking about season one, episode three. She was killed by space junk. Bad news for her, Justin. Sorry. Uh, Who is she? I know. I know, right? (laughs) Now this is uh, this episode takes its name from a Devo song. Uh, there is, as far as I was able to find, I don't know if you looked into this, only one Devo reference in Watchmen itself, which is yeah. Lori Silk Spectre in the book turning to her boyfriend. Not at the time, I don't think they've slept together yet. Uh, Dan Dryberg, the Night Owl, and saying, "Well, your goggles, they kind of look sort of Devo," and we get a lot. A lot of that in this episode, and it's kind of fascinating yeah. that they took like one line for the book and just blew it out there, you know? Yeah, they were like, Devo's big, they're huge in this universe, and goggles, yeah, people like them. Yeah, weird thing, nobody wears a weird hat at any point, so is it really Devo? I don't think so. Mm. Wow, great point. Uh, Devo is a band. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Now, uh, I do want to talk about the whole thrust of this episode, but before we get into that, let's do a recap of where we've been so far. So Please. most of the action so far has been set in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There has been the murder of the chief of police there, Judd Crawford. He was hung by from a tree. The people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the cops all dress as vigilantes. That's part of a law that was pushed by Senator Keen Jr., the son of the guy who outlawed vigilantism in the first place, uh, after an event called the White Knight, where a group called the Seventh Cavalry basically killed or attacked most of the people in the police force, including Judd Crawford, who got shot that night, as well as Angela Abar, who is now known as Sister Knight. She ostensibly, at least until this episode, has been the main character in the show. Other folks in Tulsa, Oklahoma, include Looking Glass, who's played by Tim Blake Nelson. He has a reflective surface on his mask. He takes people into a pod and is essentially able to... Not actually read their mind, but sort of read them very well. He seems to be very empathic in that way. Uh, And they've been trying to get to the bottom of what exactly went on, why they think the 7th Cavalry killed Judd Crawford. Uh, Also along for the ride, other cops you probably need to know about this episode. There's Red Scare, very aggressive dude. Pirate Jenny, who is also very aggressive. They're all in different costumes. Loves pirates. Loves pirates. Love pirates. Like everybody. Pirates are... And this actually is important, very popular in the world of Watchmen. They haven't really talked about that on the TV show, but in the comic, at least, which this follows up on, superheroes never really became popular because mask vigilantes exist. So instead, the world loves their pirates, super into them. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, So that's what's going on there, except we have a little bit more information that doesn't exactly get touched on this episode. Uh, But we know that there's something more complicated going on than just the 7th Cavalry hanging Judd Crawford from a tree. We know that he had a Ku Klux Klan uniform with a sheriff's badge hiding in his closet. It was found by Angela Abar. Also, Angela discovered him. Uh, a man that she later found out was her grandfather was sitting next to him in a wheelchair and claimed to have actually hung him from the tree, even though he's probably well over a hundred years old. And that seems like it's impossible. He also, at the end of last episode, uh, was in Angela's car and it was taken away into the air by some sort of magnetic thing, like a trash compactor type thing. Yeah, and we don't ever touch on that again. Yes. 
Uh, he's just gone. He's just gone. Uh, a lot of other things that you actually probably need to know, but interestingly, the things that have been running in the background a lot on the show, and they're mostly things that come from Watchmen, the book itself, uh, including the fact that, as we found out in some of the material that HBO released online, Lori Blake, who was formerly the... It's st- called Supplemental. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. I never know what your word to use. But it's a- Take your supplements, <laughs> Alex. Hey, thank you for putting that juxtaposition in there. I appreciate it, Justin. Brain pills. Yes. So uh, Silk Spectre was a hero back in the day around the time of the original Watchmen. She was paired, as we mentioned, with Night Owl. Night Owl was arrested, as we found out, probably for being a vigilante, but it's not totally clear. Uh, yes. Lori changed from being the Silk Spectre to being the comedian who was her father. Silk Spectre was her mother. Comedian was her father that she found out pretty late. Uh, and uh, other stuff has happened to her in the intervening time, which we'll get to in a moment. There's also a character, character called Dr. Manhattan. He's the only actual real superhero in this world. He is big. He's blue. He's naked. He lives on Mars. He is not exactly all powerful, but certainly... He exists at every time simultaneously and seems to be able to manipulate atoms and create things out of thin air. Last thing yes. you should probably know about, and this is well, a, one, one other thing yeah. on that. Um, there are other extra normal powers in oh, that's uh, in this world. There's psychic uh, powers in the comic. Um, there's an island that uh, Adrian Veidt puts together when he has a psychic and a, an empath, I believe, that can influence people. Yeah, that's that's true. That always weirded me out. I always felt like, yeah, I don't really believe that necessarily, but based on the fact that he builds a giant psychic squid, I guess it's true. That's what I'm saying. There has to be some truth to it. Yeah. The proof is in the squid pudding. Ooh, I love a good squid pudding. I got to tell you what. So uh, Dr. Manhattan's on Mars. Uh, Meanwhile, there's another character we've been speculating about pretty heavily played by Jeremy Irons. A lot of Insanity has been going on with him. People suspected yeah. that he was Adrian Veidt, who was declared dead in the very first episode of the TV show. He's the guy who set up the squid attack that killed three million people that essentially changed the entire world back in Watchmen, the comic book, though we're still seeing the after effects of that on the TV show. He has whoever Jeremy Irons is, and we find out, I think, pretty definitively this episode, he is somewhere in a house, he has two, uh, a maid and a butler named Mr. Phillips and Miss Crookshanks, who seem to have multiple copies of themselves running around. And he, yeah, he seems to have an endless supply of them. Yes. And he very frequently seems to kill them as well. Uh, and, uh, yeah. yeah, other things have happened around that. It's definitely the part that I've seen online, people scratching their heads about the most. So with all of that recap out of the way, here I want to ask you what you thought of this episode, Justin, before we actually get into the plot proper, because I have some specific thoughts about it as well. I mean, this felt like the episode most closely linked to the comics, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe that's partially because of the introduction of Lori, but um, we get uh, this uh, running joke that she's telling throughout the episode, and I that, I think, was super informative. Yeah. I really liked this episode. I thought it was a, a great sort of, it, it tilts the whole story a bit mm-hmm. uh, toward uh, Lori and toward the superhero, the vigilantes versus cops, or are vigilantes important? And I thought that was great. Yeah. One of the things that adding Laurie and changing the focus from Angela Abar, who has been the focus of the first two episodes to Laurie Blake, this episode is it really underscores something that they were driving home anyway, that you look at Angela Abar as the hero because she is the main character of the show, but she's not necessarily the hero. And when you flip the perspective over to Laurie Blake, who is essentially investigating Angela Abar the entire episode, it becomes pretty clear that, well, Angela isn't necessarily the good guy. She's not doing the right thing just because we're following her. And same thing vice yeah. versa for Lori, which if there is any overall singular point to Watchmen, and I don't believe there is, it's probably that. That you, like, you don't know who's right. There's no, it's all gray. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That everybody wants to see it as black and white, but it's never really black and white. Well, and I also, like, we've spent two episodes being like, whoa, 
uh, Sister Knight is badass. And then Laurie shows up and she's like, you think that's badass? How about this? And she sort of knocks Sister Knight on her heels a little bit. And I think that upsets, uh, like you said, the antagonist, like who's the hero, who's not. Also, like, who is powerful and who's strong? Because mm-hmm. I think this episode weakened Sister Knight a lot um, as a character. That said... A couple of things about adding Jean Smart into this episode. She's phenomenal in everything that she's in. Uh, I we love designing women. Yep, obviously that's it. Just designing women. Yep. That's the sort of a universe I've played in with mm-hmm. her. Well, we know her. We did a Legion podcast, and I always felt like as good as she was on Legion, she was never used to her full capacity. And seeing her cut yeah. loose here is great. Yeah, I agree. She was in a role where she got to do... A, but I mean, she was great in Fargo uh, mm-hmm. as well. Let, let's not forget that. Where I think she did get to cut loose. So, um, But yes, in Legion, she was sort of a little bit off to the side and sort of uh, holding ground a lot. Mm-hmm. And in this, she's clearly not holding ground. She's hyper-aggressive. And in particular, her scenes with Regina King are... <laughs> Electric, Like, not to overuse yeah. that word, but they really feel like that. That is some of the tensest scenes we've seen on the show and on television period this year. Yeah, I don't like to overuse words either, but I got to say it's like electric supplemental juxtaposition <laughs> the entire time. I couldn't agree more. Uh, on the other hand, though, I would say as much as I love this episode and as excited as I am to have Lori on board... There was a part of me that was bummed to bring in this much Watchmen in this episode and stuff in in this much because I've liked what's going on in Tulsa so much and the fact that it's been sort of skimming the water of Watchmen without ever dipping its toe in. And here it just dived, dove fully under the surface. It was like, nope, this is the world of Watchmen. Here's Laurie Blake. We're talking about Dr. Manhattan. Guess what? Spoiler for later in the episode. Jeremy Irons is Adrian Fight and he's wearing the Ozymandias costume. Like it was yeah. it was a lot all at once. Uh yeah, but I think they dispensed that information in a way that was super useful mm-hmm. and digestible. Um like I, I mean, I don't know how we want to break down the episode, but talking about the the joke that Laurie is telling to uh ostensibly Dr. Manhattan, mm-hmm. but he may or may not be listening at all. I thought that really uh, was a great sort of wraparound for the episode and really set a lot of things, set the stakes for a lot of things. In terms of general continuity of the episode, in case it wasn't clear to anybody listening, what I took away from it is that we have Lori Blake at the beginning at the bank (laughs) being sent. This is the very rough plot of the episode. She's sent to Tulsa to investigate. A lot of stuff happens there. Uh, She is ultimately very thrown by everything that's happened. And she goes to a phone booth that I imagine lots of towns have where it says yeah. you can call Dr. Manhattan on Mars and he'll be listening to you. Uh, of note, it's run by Lady True, who we still haven't met yet, but is mentioned in particular several times this episode. Yeah, I think this is the first episode that really leaned into her mm-hmm. as an important force. Yeah, and... Uh, so like you're saying, uh, Lori tells this joke or it seems like several jokes over the course of the episode and then ultimately comes out of that booth and is presented with a rather surprising scene right at the end there. So all of the things that we're seeing with the telling of the joke, they happen at the end chronologically. Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, so that all said, do, do we want to walk through it? What, what do you think? Yeah. How's your voice hold it up, dude? Good. Uh, I'm getting better, but it's uh, not at 100%. I'll tell you that much. Okay, you should call Dr. Manhattan and see what he can do about that. Get a prescription. I do. I just don't know if he's out there. Oh, man. This sounds like my doctor. Wow. Yeah. Dr. Goldstein. Shot across the... Wow, huge takedown to Dr. Goldstein. Here's the thing. Dr. Goldstein also walking around with his dick out all the time. Not great. Yeah, but... And he's the only... Uh, he claims to be the only doctor with superpowers in... In New York, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, what do we start off with? We, do you want to talk about... Uh, let's talk about the wraparound at the end, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we do get that first scene in the bank. You see Lori walking <laughs> in, and it's such a nice shot. I wrote down this note here. Just the 
she's not in costume the entire time. We know from the history, she's been Silk Spectre, she's been Comedienne, but she still, she has this coat and it's ruffling out almost like Sister Knight's cape as it's behind her. And it's such a smart yeah. visual choice. Well, and I think it, it goes to show like, at the end of the day, a costume and a mask is just a f- type of clothing. Mm-hmm. It's the intention behind it all. And she is costuming herself and she is putting on this persona that is specific and it is a choice. And I would argue it's the same as a vigilante. She acts the same as any other vigilante throughout this entire episode. I mean, later on, she tells that joke to Angela at the funeral where she says, uh, what's the difference between a vigilante, mass vigilante and a cop wearing a mask? And Angela Abar says, I don't know. And she says, I don't know either. And I think that's yeah. that's the whole point of the episode and almost the whole point yeah. of the show right there. And I love that she she became the comedian and she's clearly taken some improv classes mm-hmm. and she's been hitting open mics because she is telling jokes all day or day. Yeah, she is probably funnier than the comedian was because the comedian in the book, most of his jokes are like, you know what dies? Squirrels die sometimes. And people are like, yeah. uh, all right, buddy. Uh, cool, man. Yeah. Great. Hey, here's a, f- I mean, you, you don't see a lot of comedians going by, hi, I'm comedian, uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Right. Well, he, so when you throw the, the C word in there, I'll tell you though, he does do a show where he's driving around, Getting coffee, and that is comedians in cars getting coffee. Do you think it's and the comedian in cars getting coffee? Yeah, they actually murder somebody at oh, the shit. end of every... I guess you haven't watched it all the way to the end. No. At the end of every episode. That's why Crackle's actually a broadcast from a, a lawless uh, ship in the middle of the ocean. That must be why Chicken Soup bought them. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, she goes into this bank and immediately starts robbing the bank. Uh, a vigilante comes in. To stop her, very Batman esque, like very oh, clearly, super Batman. Uh, and she takes a hostage and immediately turns it around on him and says, "Hey, how'd you find out about this? Oh, you must have gotten a tip. Did you get a tip? Maybe, maybe the sort of thing that the FBI would use to trap you if you were a vigilante." And he's like, "Ah, crap!" Uh, and gets shot. And there's an interesting uh, thing that happens right after this. He falls through the door. He crashes through the glass there, which reminded me of two things. The first thing it reminded me of is the last episode, who did justice smashing through the glass going into the grocery store. But more than yeah. anything, to me, that seems like a clear visual shout out to the comedian, Eddie Blake, getting thrown through the window in the first issue of Watchmen, the comic book. Interesting. So that makes her the Ozymandias of that situation. I think so. Like, like we've been talking about, everybody on the show is a mix of all of the characters. It's not clear. Yeah. And uh, her more than anybody else. Like she's, she's taken on characteristics of absolutely everybody, I think. Yeah. And sort of the series as a whole, of like the sort of dark uh, brooding figure over the whole, in the whole story, just like, pushing the more aggressive side of the of the narrative. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to point out that I thought was fun just with the world building stuff. They've done a lot of things over the past couple of episodes and in the supplementary material where they've pointed out real world people that have taken on their the jobs. Like I believe uh I think it was Judd Crawford fought under Robert Mueller in Vietnam for example, and there was uh, Henley Lewis Gates Jr. in the last episode, again, a real historian who now was the, what was he, the labor secretary? Yeah, I think so. Okay, something like that. So this one, there was a newspaper headline as Laurie was locking in, and it said, yeah. Grisham retires from Supreme Court. John Grisham? It, it has to be, right? That's what I thought, because I saw that, and I was like, who could that be? That's a funny, what a weird choice. Yeah. Well, it's also disappointing because of this world, they probably never got the firm or the Pelican brief. Oh my God. A world without the Pelican brief. Ugh. Such great, uh, drama from, um, I want to say Julia Roberts. Yeah. I think that one was Julia Roberts and Denzel Washington. And Denzel. Yeah. It was, in, it, that was one of the John Grisham books where, the ending is they take all their money and they go to the Caribbean. He writes like three books where they're like, I've got a solution to our problems. Let's run yeah. away to the Caribbean. 
Spoiler. That's wishful thinking as a writer. He's like, I'm going to take my money someday and move to the Caribbean. Hasn't happened yet. Now he's writing Christmas stories or whatever. Blech. Blech. Uh, you want to keep walking us through it, though? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, well, we uh, we have the, the joke. Well, I guess we should talk about the joke at the end. But um, after that, she goes to her home, and she feeds a mouse to a caged creature. I thought for a second that was going to be uh, Barbastus. Oh, Babastus? Uh, Barbastus? Babastus, yeah. Yeah. But I think you're right. It's Babastus. Yeah. Yeah. I, I th- From the comics. Don't know. I think there was something that I read where they used Babastus cloning technology for something in this world, but I don't know if we're yeah. going to see a Babastus, which is a real bummer. I think we'll see. You think so? Yeah. All right. Uh, but uh, we find out a moment later that it's an owl, mm-hmm. uh, which is interesting. Uh, Senator Keene shows up, and uh, they talk about the couple vigilantes, the Revenger being one of them. I love how stupid the names are. Yes. Uh, Two other things that I'll mention here that maybe I'm reading too much into, but there's a silver briefcase <laughs> that Laurie has that we flash back to a couple of times throughout the episode, and eventually it's revealed what's in there. She's opening the lock and I couldn't quite see, but it certainly looked like her combination is six, 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 which given the whole joke that she has going on where she's talking about the God and devil seems yeah. like a pretty clear underline there. The other one, and I almost definitely am reading too much into this, but they flash several times at her door number and her door yeah. number is four Oh six. The only reference yeah. I could find there is Page 406 of Watchmen is the page where Dr. Manhattan kills Rorschach in the book. Interesting. But I don't know what that has to do with anything. Yeah. I mean, and I noticed 406 and then 238 was Petey's um, motel room door later. Um, I don't know what that is in reference to. Is that 237. Sh- oh, yeah. That's, 237 is the shining one. So. I, Maybe that's I feel like one we're more. starting to get a little two three room two three seven about this the deeper we go into it. But as I that movie had a lot of great points. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of great points in that movie. Uh so yeah, we get this conversation with Senator Keene. It's an interesting way that they relate to each other as well, because he's coming in all shirt unbuttoned, clearly the middle of the night. It almost seems like it's a romantic thing at first, though it clearly yeah. isn't at the end. Uh, and yeah. whatever the relationship is, is a little unclear to me. It is. And it feels like he's very cocky and casual. And the way he sort of puts her on this assignment to go to Tulsa makes me think that he knows it's actually not the seventh cavalry behind the murder of Judd. Mm-hmm. There's, this is very much jumping ahead, but, uh, we get to the funeral later on, and the third issue of Watchmen is also the funeral of Eddie Blake, the comedian, which, of course, is part of this greater conspiracy. Uh, one thing we don't exactly get in ex- in the same way uh, that happens in the third issue of the book is we get to find out a lot more about the comedian as every individual character flashes back throughout their experiences with him and describes those for us. Uh, So we find out a little bit more about he's a horrible guy. We don't get that with Judd Crawford, um, but certainly another thing that we get, and this is certainly said by suspicious flares up, like you've been talking a lot about how the dude who plays Senator Keene was a jerk on Mad Men, right? He was a a liar, like maybe a sociopath, someone who was like, just faked his credentials and blended in in this in high society. Yeah. There's, there's a very clear indicator and I don't know if this is going to end up being a spoiler uh, because we did read the book, but when Senator that first, that conversation with Lori seems very weird and disingenuous. And then later on when he gets attacked at the funeral, yeah, he, to me, that struck me a lot. Like when Adrian Veidt sets up his own assassination, in Watchmen, uh, yeah. down to we get again. This is very much jumping ahead, but when uh, Jeremy Irons is eventually revealed to be Adrian Veidt, and he's standing there in the full costume, looking at the camera, and the lightning is crashing in the background. The juxtaposition is Senator uh-huh. Keen saying, "I'm not the hero here," and then it cuts immediately to him. And to yeah. me, that was. 
isn't that basically what Adrian Veidt says in that yeah, issue? Yeah, I think maybe even word for word where he's like, uh, I wasn't a hero here. Because he's talking about action figures, and he, like, I think he kills the line of action figures. Yeah, he kills the line right, of right action figures. He, I'm, because he's like, I'm not a hero. I'm just doing what I do. Yeah, and to me, that seemed like almost purposely tipping their hat to people who have read the book, whether it'll turn yeah. out the same way or not. Certainly that's up for debate, but uh, that seems a pretty clear indicator that Keed isn't totally above the board. Yeah. I mean, he's, he has every indicator of being a villain, <laughs> whether he is a, a smart villain or a stupid villain, I think remains to be seen. Absolutely. I was thinking to your point about the third issue of Watchmen being, um, this funeral and the mystery is sort of slowly unfolding and it's a very like uh, nuanced like beautifully drawn mystery well this mystery feels like a little bit brash and a little bit like punchy in the face nosebleed style Mm -hmm. mystery Um, and I think that's a indicative of what of the different time like that I think that they're making with this television series is to be like the world's a little, this issue that we're dealing with like race is a little bit more fucked up. It's a little bit more in your face. So the mystery is going to be a little bit more aggressive. That's why you have like a suicide bomber at the funeral rather than subtle reveals of character history. I think that also points to just the media as well, that what Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons were doing was they were responding to action comic books to the point that, when you read Watchmen carefully, like we did, there's almost no action in it whatsoever that whenever there is an action scene, they almost cut away here. They're responding to superhero TV shows, but at the same time, they are making a TV show and they are trying to entertain people. Um, I think that's one of the big differences here is that's why you have more thrilling sequences, more action sequences throughout is just to make entertainment, you know? Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know necessarily, but uh, that's my takeaway from it. Yeah. Uh, we get a great look at the art behind Lori and her house, which is uh, several members of the uh, the Minutemen, mm-hmm. which I oh, thought was sort of a nice Men. close-up on the, uh, or sorry. the uh, Oh, my God. What do they call themselves? The new Crime Busters or something like that? Yeah, the, the, crime, the crime Busters, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Watchmen, what we all call the Watchmen. Right, the team that everybody calls the, the Watchmen, team. and they call the Watchmen yeah. in the book. Uh, now, I was stared at this for way too long because you have, what is it? It was Ozymandias... Was it Osmandius, Night Owl, Dr. Manhattan, and Silk Spectre in this war, war hall set up? War hall, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Silk Spectre, and they have this lovely shot where they pivot from Gene Smart to the <laughs> painting. That's clearly Gene Smart as Silk Spectre. And so I yeah. kept looking at who is Dr. Manhattan, and it's impossible to tell just based on the face. No, shape. you can't tell, yeah. But he, he was a little more, like, broad-faced mm-hmm. than the Dr. Manhattan in the comics, so yeah. maybe that's a clue. Uh, like a little, like, fuller. Yeah. So you think it's like uh, uh, Louis Anderson or something? Yeah, that's what I was going for. What a great reveal that would be. That would be huge. Yeah. Ooh, mixing it into the basket cinematic universe. Oh, and the voice is so, like, godlike. Yeah. I, I can't really criticize anyone's voice right now, but um, in your face, Louis Anderson. <laughs> Uh, one thing that I uh, I did want to mention that I don't think we touched on in previous episodes, and it was in the background, becomes very much in the foreground here because we're seeing the FBI and we're seeing the funeral parade and everything else, is that the flag of the United States is different in the world of Watchmen yeah. because I don't know if there's additional states, but definitely Vietnam has been added as a state. So they I think there's going to be a bunch more states. Probably. What else do you think is a state? Probably like Brazil? Uh, Brazil, uh, what a weird first guess. I don't know. Um, I don't know, Canada. Iceland. Guam. Iceland. Yeah. Well, what was that one that Trump Greenland. wanted to buy? Greenland. He wanted to buy Greenland. Greenland. Great, yeah. great choice. So probably Vietnam and Greenland. What a fun fact for the history book to have in it later. <laughs> Are you talking about if we have if we ever have those again? Yeah, probably not. Let's get rid of them. We'll just have copies yeah. of Watchmen with lenticular that, covers. The real them. history. <laughs> uh, so then we get the scene where she goes to the FBI, right? And she walks into the FBI. Yeah, uh, and we get this sort of lead agent breaking down what's going on in Tulsa. 
Um, the cops went and took away all the guns from who they thought were racists, which we touch on later. Then there's this under agent who we later find out is PD, and he has slid in a page from Rorschach's journal. And the uh, lead agent is like, get that the fuck out of here. Why? I can't believe you did that. He recaps the white knight. Lori's like, I don't need any other agents. I'm going alone, but I'm taking PD, the guy who had the Rorschach page. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting because she seems to hate anything that has anything to do with superheroics. Yeah, here she is bringing PD along. I think, so. first of all, this is the PD from the PD files that they've been putting online. It's the PDpedia. The PDpedia. Uh, and very sad that our co-host Pete is not here this week to talk about this because I know how much he likes us saying the name PD, 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 Pete, Pete. Uh, yeah. Very unfortunate. Uh, but PD, as we find out for the PD, PDia files is working in the, like, sub-basement closet. So this is a big break for him. So that's very exciting. But I think it seems clear to me, I was trying to figure out what the point of this scene is, because this lead FBI agent is giving us a lot of information we know. The agents don't know it, but we already know it. So other than recap, what's the point there? And I think it's about their relationship with Lori and Lori's relationship with them. And as much as she is a super agent who is real good at her job and can clearly do almost anything, it seems like they are very dismissive of her at the same time because of her vigilante past. And I just like the rest of the vigilantes were in the Watchmen in the comic book and in the team. Yeah, absolutely. And which is something that plays into her overarching joke. Uh, by the end. Yeah. And I think that's why she chooses Petey is she sees him as another outsider being shoved down. So she spends most of the episode dismissing him and pushing him down the same way that she's been dismissed and pushed down. So it is really this very comedian esque cycle of abuse that's going on. Um, But I think she kind of sees a kindred spirit at the same time. Well, and I guess that makes sense because he need. I think she also needs the information he has. Uh, she thinks it's going to be useful in this investigation. And so she just can't help but treat him the same way she's always been treated. I also think this scene is helpful because it um, gets us. We've been on the side of Sister Knight and the cops mm-hmm. so far in the first two episodes. And this sort of criticizes what the cops are doing this scene and sets us up to look at uh, the cops in Tulsa from another point of view, which then we see them for the rest of the episode from Lori's point of view and the FBI agents. Yeah. So I, I thought that was an interesting, like I said, a pivot earlier. And it's a commentary on the structure, right? We touched on this a little bit earlier, but the idea that you watch a TV show, particularly the first episode is so HBO in terms of throwing you into the world of Watchmen and saying, here's what it is. All the cops wear masks. One of them is a panda. Let's just roll with it. There's a squid rain. And to your point, this scene taking a step back and being like, yo, that's that's crazy. That is fucking crazy what they're doing there. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, it's just Tulsa that's doing that. You know, later on, uh, Keen says it's a program that he's trying to uh, pivot into other cities and get into other cities because crime has been down 80 percent. He thinks it's great, uh, but it's clearly an anomaly. It's an aberration and they see it as such. Yeah, and that, I thought that was interesting that he said that because it's like, what's the point of, like, crime is down 80%. That I don't know, it, it points to the, what is his scam mm-hmm. to try to make every get people in masks when his whole thing is getting the vigilantes who wear masks off the street. I'm uh, Yeah, this is the thing that I think we don't have all the information yet, right? You know, in terms of what his plan is, uh, yeah. if it's good, if it's bad. But he... Uh, he clearly he clearly wants to become president, like she says, regardless of what he's saying after Judd Crawford's funeral, uh, that he's very focused on the 7th Cavalry. Um, that's his ultimate goal. But he maybe has a bigger goal beyond that. And the fact that he is almost contradicting what his father did in terms of banning vigilantes and him <laughs> essentially bringing them back in sort of a more legal way. Maybe it's a daddy issue thing. Maybe it's something more complicated and deeper than that. Again, I I don't think we have all the clues about him at this point to really understand what he's up to. 
And I got to think he's p- central to the overarching mystery of the season. Yeah. Uh, so we get this nice cut, uh, this fade from the projector in the FBI room to uh, the plane that is flying into Tulsa. And we get a couple of nice interactions here. First of all, uh, Lori has a sleep mask on. She's sleeping. But then Petey reveals that he has a mask mask, uh, like a Lone Ranger mask which he becomes very important to her later on. Um, but he's like, oh, you know, when we're in Rome, uh, do as the Romans do, I'm going to dress as them. And she, again, like just sh- shits on him the entire yeah. time. Uh, and then he gives this great speech to her where he's like, I have a PhD. I studied you. I'm not going to pretend that I didn't. I'm not necessarily a fanboy, but I'm not not a fan, you know? And I thought yeah. that was so nice. Like I loved. It was cool. I love them just laying it out there immediately. Uh, we also get a little information about Lady True that she bought uh, Adrian Veidt's company. And it, then this scene starts with him saying the famous Ozymandias quote, look on my works in despair, which I was it. I, they're using the source material in a way I'm like, I don't know exactly what this <laughs> means, but it feels important. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it's also when he's looking out at Lady True's Millennium Clock, I think, uh, yeah. which is this bonkers looking structure in the middle of Oklahoma that is something, clearly it's something. Yeah. But again, we don't have a lot of information on what it is or what its purpose is. Clocks seem important to Watchmen. Uh, yeah, time. Yeah. I mean, I assume she built it. For the millennium, which is since passed, obviously. Right. So, well, and the other reference there is Adrian <laughs> Veidt's company pivoted from nostalgia to millennium when he dropped the squid. His whole idea was he wanted to look hopeful and towards the future. Uh, again, through an article that they released, an obituary for Adrian Veidt, uh, they laid out that that was very unsuccessful, that people were actually too scared after the squid to reach that hopefulness that he thought uh, would come with bringing the world together against an alien threat, uh, which is a really interesting detail just in terms of the Adrian Veidt of it all, that he was ultimately partially successful but also actually very unsuccessful, which led to, I believe, him being in a position where Lady True could buy his company. And I think that's going to play into a lot of the Jeremy Iron stuff. Um, I have a theory on that that we'll Ooh. talk about maybe in a little bit All right. um, about what is happening there. Um, but uh, what are, you, are we going to get to see New York, you think, eventually in the show where the squid hit? I don't know. We're so focused on Oklahoma, even the scenes with the FBI in Washington, D.C., we don't get to see a lot of it. We get to see the bank, the exterior of the bank, and the FBI building, and that's it, Um, which I don't mind. I'm okay with just staying in Oklahoma, staying away from everything, um, rather than the entirety of the world. But on the other hand, the book tends to wide it out as it goes on. So I imagine we may do yeah. the same thing here. But I would also argue uh, so much of the Watchmen book is focused on the actual place where the disaster happened. Mm-hmm. Like we're there the entire series. So that may mean that we're at in Tulsa in mm-hmm. these points because that's where this next horrible thing is going to happen. Yeah. Or maybe great thing. That's really positive of you, Alex. Yeah, thanks. Um, you're a real looking glass. Thanks, man. Uh, uh, so Lori comes upon, she gets to Tulsa, comes upon Red Scare and Pirate Jenny uh, roughing up a dude, doesn't like it, and just wants to go get to Looking Glass. There's a great um, line also that she has here where uh, she turns to the 7th Cavalry member that uh, is being abused, and she says, hey, are they uh, abusing your rights? And he's like, oh, yeah, thank God. And she's like, I don't fucking care. I, I was kidding. Yeah. And it's that to me actually is like almost the most comedian joke that she makes the entire episode where yeah. it's just, this is, this is awful. You're an awful person. You're being terrible. Um, but yeah, then she goes in and she finds looking glass. Uh, she sees they're going uh, real quick, real quick on yeah. that. Um, it is interesting that this Lori Blake is so the comedian when the Lori Blake in the comic is not really at all. Mm. In fact, she rejects the comedian yeah. um, as a person, and at the very end is maybe just slightly accepting him as her father. 
But the fact that her worldview has changed so drastically to the point where she is just as cynical and um, spiteful of the rest of the world as he is, is wild. I think they... Over 30 years. Well, I think they make a good case for it because it has been three decades. She does underline towards the end of her conversation with Dr. Manhattan, her one-sided conversation, that he left her on on another planet for 30 years alone. And she seems truly heartbroken at the end. Yeah. Like truly wrecked. uh, And you get to, she exposes that vulnerability at the end, which I thought was really nice. Yeah. And I think that's what's happened. You know, she lost dad Dryberg. She lost Dr. Manhattan. Uh, Probably her mother is gone. We, see shades, very, very small shades of the Silk Spectre that we know from the book. Um, We get to see the uh, Silk Spectre takes Dr. Manhattan cover of Esquire when she finally opens up the case. That's definitely where my focus was in that moment. Yes. Oh, not on the enormous, shiny, blue vibrator? What are you talking about? Oh, yeah. I didn't even notice that. I was really focused on other stuff. That Um, I I I have no idea. I only read vibrators for the magazines. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, that, that, that reminded me. Out. There's a uh, in Watchmen. Her mother, the first Silk Spectre, has like uh, what is it called? The Tijuana Bible. A dir- Tijuana Bible. Tijuana yeah. Bible. A dirty cartoon about her that Dan Dryberg finds, and Lori is grossed out about it. She's like, "Oh, why do you keep that around, Mom?" And then thirty years down the line, she's doing exactly the same thing. We're just on our way to becoming our parents, Oh, Alex. gosh. What kinky sex stuff are my parents into that I'm going to be into soon? Oh, uh, I can't wait to find out. Nice. Uh, but then the other moment that is very Silk Spectre, again, at the end of the episode, is she, after she encounters Angela Abar, they have this showdown. She's completely thrown. She ends up trembling, going to Petey's room, and she ends up, we don't see it, but she ends up sleeping with Petey. And as Petey is asleep in the bed, he's wearing the mask, which is almost uh, almost a reverse of what happened when she first slept with Night Owl, where he could only get it up if he was in the costume. Like, literally, yeah. he was impotent until he put on the costume. And it almost seems like the same thing here. Like, she can't psych herself up to get into sex with this enormous blue vibrator. But once she has Petey put on the mask, that's when she can complete it. Yeah. And also I think it touches on, she's so freaked out when she's, uh, when Dr. Manhattan doubles himself mm-hmm. uh, in the comic when they're having sex. And now she's, uh, cause she thinks it's weird. And now she's pursuing all these other ways of sexually satisfying herself that are not just like having sex. Yeah. Uh, So that's a lot of stuff that happens at the end of the episode, but let's jump back to where we were. She goes in, sees the Tulsa Police Department is going nuts, rounding up the 7th Cavalry. They are doing it in the final hours before Judd Crawford's funeral. It's absolute madness there. Uh, And she asks where Looking Glass is, uh, says... They say, is he expecting you? And she says, oh, I sure hope not. And goes into his pod and confronts him and immediately throws him off. She calls it a racist detector. That was funny. Very funny. Steals his control, flips through the pictures. Uh, He she uh, cleans out a seed in her teeth reflected on his face uh, and immediately calls out his name in two different ways. Uh, Yeah, she makes a mockery of him, this whole process. She knows everything about everyone already. She's just nine steps ahead of all of them. And I I loved how this scene is structured because it's very on the nose in terms of the metaphor, but and they're very obvious about it. But literally she takes the controller for the pod, and then there's a certain point when he says, May I have the control back, please? And she hands it to him, and you can see the conversation turns around where he's still not in complete control of what's going on, but looking glass is able to moderate himself and push her along in the path, the way that she was being pushed along before. Yeah. Hey, the remote is a powerful device. It is. That's why I don't let anybody use the remote, you know, when I'm on the couch. Yeah. Classics. Like that's a great last man standing plot line, I believe, Alex. Oh man. That was one of my favorite episodes. By the way, check out our 
uh, last man static watch podcast for war on that. Yeah, man. A lot of just pure Tim Allen, pure <laughs> uncut t- Tim Allen. You know what I mean? Snortable Tim Allen. You know who doesn't need home improvement? Tim Allen. That's right. Uh, I love she has a line where she's going to attend the funeral, uh, Lori, and she says, I need to change into something darker, which is what she's done uh, from Silk Spectre to the Lori Blake that we know now. Yeah. Um, we see she goes to the motel, and the motel is called the Black Freighter. Inns and Suites. That was, uh, was fun. So uh, the funny thing about that to me is, like we talked about, uh, this world isn't really interested in superheroes. It's interested in pirates as pop figures. And Black Freighter was an actual comic in the world of Watchmen. It's almost like calling it the action comics in and Sweets. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm there. Yeah. I'd I'm go there. there. That would be pretty sweet. And yeah, if there was a, if there was a uh, hotel chain called uh, Final Crisis, the Batman <laughs> of Zur and R uh, Motel, I'm, I'm there. Yeah, I'll be in the Rainbow Room. Uh, yeah, she, she stays there. Uh, she gets dressed in her, to your point, costume. Uh, she gets dressed in her funeral bra- blacks. Um, and wait, what did I... Right there, I wrote some note that says Lori gives up fun, except she doesn't. I don't know what that mm. means. I mean, if it's at the funeral, she tells a fun joke uh, to Angela, gun. but then basically threatens her. Gun. That's what it was. It was an autocorrect of gun to fun in my notes. Uh, because they, they get into the funeral, and immediately they're told to give up their guns. And Petey uh, is like, oh, I got to hold on to it. And Lori says, just give him the gun. But ultimately, she's the one that holds on to her gun at the funeral. Oh, big time. Not exactly saves the day. Certainly arguably what goes on. Uh, but she holds on to it. She has a great exchange with Angela Abar, uh, where she goes up, introduces herself not just to Angela, but also to Cal, her husband, who... Uh, so I, I here's my question here. W- okay. What is, what's going on with Cal? Is anything going on with Cal? Is Cal just Angela's husband, or is there something more going on? Because it seems so pointed that she introduced herself to him and knew his name and knew who he was. I mean, I think for the purposes of that scene, I think that was just a power play. Okay. Uh, For the overarching show, uh, hard to say. I mean, Cal just seems like uh, grounding for uh, for Angela to show that she actually... Because they do seem to have like a loving relationship, and she's like is happy in her marriage and her family. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's interesting because Watchmen, the comic book was so focused on its characters. Every single person was a piece of the puzzle in some way here. Maybe it's just because it's a TV show and that's how TV shows function. It feels like we have all these supporting ancillary characters like Cal, like uh, Judd Crawford's wife, who are there and it makes sense to have them there, but they don't feel like the th- part of the thrust of the main narrative yet. Yeah. Though I do think Judd's wife seems suspect to me. Yeah. We see her here in a second, give a speech and then pass the buck to Angela. And she seems like she knows everything about everything and is involved in the conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah. That's possible. I, I think that would not be surprising at all. Uh, and then Angela gives their speech, except she reveals that, she and Judd made a pact that they would write their own funeral speeches and read them. (coughs) They decided to do that after the white night um, so that nobody else would get to choose what they do. Uh, And she ends up singing the last roundup by Gene Autry. Lovely, lovely, very lovely. Also sets up what a lot of the show has been so far and what it keeps touching on, uh, which is a Western but we get a face off immediately after that. And I thought that was such a neat, precise way of setting that up. Yeah. A classic Western face off, uh, though it, that was the only way it was classic because it was a member of the seventh cavalry who crawls out of, um, the ground and has a suicide vest on grabs keen. Lori ices him instantly. Yeah. Um, not thinking that about the uh, heartbeat trigger that he had just mentioned, and uh, Angela, thinking quickly, throws him, the 7th Cavalry member, in the grave, 
uh, the coffin on top, blowing Judd's body into a million little pieces. Yeah, that is to the point what we were saying earlier about action sequences. Like, this is completely unlike Eddie Blake's funeral <laughs> and mostly anything I'd watched with a comic book. But it is such a thrillingly well-staged action sequence. Yeah, that was great. And seeing Angela no hesitation leap into action and just grab the body. You could see the adrenaline pulsing through Regina King when she's doing it. Yeah, she's so good. Oh, my God. It's amazing. Uh, Now, was this Laurie testing Angela? mm, Why else would she do this? What do you mean, Laurie testing? Why would she uh, shoot the guy? I mean, you would think she would know that he had the, the heartbeat trigger. I, Why would she risk? Because if that blew up, then she may have died. I feel like, I don't know. I think she was being honest. Uh, there's a scene later on where she confronts Angela, and she says, they never have the heartbeat trigger. I don't know what we would have done without you. And I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm being naive, but I really read that as actual honesty. Like, she's trying to have a conversation with Angela as a peer there before it turns, before it becomes completely confrontational because she knows who Angela is and there's a chance that they could work together until things don't turn out that way. But see, I, I took it as uh, sarcastic when she was like, I don't know what we would have done without you making fun of the fact that she knows she's a vigilante, uh, a cop, a masked vigilante cop. And to be like, I don't know what we've done without you calls into question Mm -hmm. her role. It could have been like, you can't be, you can't be a hero normally on a normal day without your mask on yet. You did it here. What's your deal? I mean, it it might be something like she went to looking glasses, most vulnerable place and exposed him in exactly the right way and essentially owned him. And that maybe that's what she's trying to do with Angela as well is she knew Angela would never say, yes, I am Sister Knight, unless she forced her into a situation where she had to do something essentially superhuman. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It, it feels like that was her way of doing that. Okay. Yeah, that that makes sense. That isn't how I read it when I saw it, but I think that makes a lot of sense the way that you are explaining it. Uh, but then after that explosion, we go to this... Uh, so so much information here. Seeing oh the Vite stuff. Oh my god! Yes, crazy. Yes. So like he's building this uh, what looks like a, a submarine, an old timey submarine suit, um, and then gets one of his clone guys to go in it, and then he freezes. Yeah, uh, one of the Mister Phillips. And, yeah, and so that to me is he's in space, and this was he's building a space suit. And totally not doing a good job. Right. Well, he's also clearly making it out of buffalo skin or bison skin or something like that. And it's not air or water type. Right. He He's tanning hides before that. So he's clearly building it himself. We get so much information in this, I don't know, what is it, five minutes or whatever this is in the episode, which is insane, yeah. where... Yeah, something is happening with the spacesuit. He flips out, breaks this Mr. Phillips. Another Mr. Phillips comes up to him. He gets, he says, all right, I guess we're just going to have to try harder. Uh, And he goes out to kill a bison. And then some guy in a mask shoots at him and says, no, this is out of the bounds uh, that man, the game warden. he's the game warden, uh, has sent him a letter. I'm telling this a little out of order here, uh, but has sent him a letter and the game warden essentially says, this is against the rules, the way that we set them up. Uh, you are in violation, sir. And if you do it again, I may have to do something worse. Uh, throughout these scenes, also, we get all of these teases, and they keep just stepping back from the Adrian Vite of it all, where first we see a purple mask on a bust, and you're like, oh, okay, I think they're indicating he's Adrian Vite. And then the game yeah. warden sends him the letter, and uh, Miss Crookshanks reads it and says, dear, and he says, oh, just skip over it. Just skip yeah. over the name. Don't say the name. Which they're just, they're playing with us so hard in the scene. Yeah. And... 
he ends up writing a letter back saying, no, I have done nothing in violation. Uh, I am just doing the things that were within the bounds of our agreement. Uh, and he ends the letters by saying, yours respectfully, and looks directly at camera and says, Adrian Veidt. And yeah. then we get to see him put the Ozymandias costume on. He also earlier on says, when he's dictating a letter, I'm not some Republic serial villain, which is exactly what he says to Night Owl and Rorschach right before he does the, um, I did it 35 minutes ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, which is the classic line from Watchmen. Uh, so the entire thing, what I loved about this is, again, it's like five, ten minutes of the episode, but they spend so hard teasing this thing that we've suspected for the past three episodes, but they don't keep teasing it out, which I thought was great and uh, true to the spirit of Watchmen to just be like, we present you with this thing, and then we reveal that it's true by the end. Yeah. Uh and I don't know, there's so much going on here. Um, there's a lot of clues, I think, in this section uh, that maybe indicate a little bit more about what's going on. Well, so what did you say you had a theory about this? Yeah, so I think that um, I think that he is in space. He's uh, maybe on, on the surface of Mars. And he is uh, either, it, it's, this is either his heaven or his hell. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would argue that it's his hell. Um, he's which I think the black freighter imagery uh, that we see the flag and mm-hmm. the stamp on the letter from the game warden. Um, because in, in the comic, the black freighter is like the journey to hell that all that the main character is going on. Yeah. And I think Adrian Veidt is trapped here. He's lost his mind and he is, um, you know, tilting at windmills, chasing after these, like going on these little missions, trying to escape, but he just doesn't have the mental resources to do it anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, that seems, Pretty accurate. I do wonder the thing that uh, certainly put a big question mark above my head was him saying or the game warden saying that they had some sort of agreement. So I do wonder if there's some sort of like he agreed to do something and it's gone horribly wrong or something like that. I I don't know. That to me played like an old Western Mm -hmm. subplot. Like the whole thing is so goofy. The letter he writes, because I I think it's interesting you you, uh, use that quote from the comic, the uh, Republic supervillain, serial villain. Yeah. And that was very, sounded very cool when he did it in the comic. Mm -hmm. And it sounded goofy and ridiculous when he did it in the show. So I think that's what they're saying is like he's lost his mind. And I think the two ways it could go, it could be Dr. Manhattan created this place for him as like a retirement home where he can just like live out his years even though he's lost it mm-hmm. without having to face the reality that he has uh, lost his mind. Or he's trapped there uh, because of what he did on Earth, uh, all the pain he caused everyone and has to suffer uh, as this loose cannon, uh, a shadow of the former hero that he was. Uh, The other thing that indicates uh, just the passage of time here, and I do wonder, given that they're almost definitely playing with time and how things are happening and when they're happening in this, is when uh, Mr. Phillips and Miss Crookshanks bring out the honeycomb cake for him in this episode, there's three candles on it. Instead of the previous episode, there were two, and in the first episode, there were one. I would suspect that means that he has been there for at least three years. Exactly. That's what I was going to say, too. I think I think we're going to find out that he is just in this endless cycle of nonsense, mm-hmm. like Don Quixote, where he has been here for years and years, just trapped. So uh, what I do wonder also is if these scenes aren't taking place before everything that we've seen on the show so far, that eventually... I don't know if he does get out of there and it does connect in some way by episode nine. <sighs> maybe, maybe we'll have seen nine years pass, you know, or something like yeah. that. I don't know. I think that's uh, spot on. I bet every episode will be another year for him. Yeah. Poor guy. Uh, also, Jeremy Irons looks real goofy in that costume. I will say. It's hilarious. Oh my God. That's what I love about it. It's so goofy. Yeah. And he's meant to be the this vaunted hero slash villain of the comic book. And he's a goofy fucker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one other thing that I noted down that I thought was interesting uh, was at different points in the episode, 
both Lori and Adrian look directly in camera. I think Lori looks directly in camera when she is called out by looking glass in the pod. Uh, and Adrian looks directly in the camera um, when he reveals his name. I don't know if there's any connection there other than visually, like we've talked about the episode. Well, these episodes will often have a visual motif towards the beginning, a visual motif towards the end that repeat themselves. Um, or if it means there is some sort of connection between them. Well, it's very superhero mm-hmm. to be looking out of the panel right at uh, off the page. So I think that to me makes them the heroes of this. Yeah. And Adrian, Adrian makes a lot of sense to me because there were several panels that Dave Gibbons draws where he does look directly at the viewer uh, in the comic book. So that seemed consistent. It was just interesting to me that Laurie did that as well. Yeah. Uh, so as we mentioned, uh, they cut back to this uh, speech that Keen Jr. is giving where he says, I'm not the hero here. The focus is on the 7th Cavalry. I'm just here to support and help everybody. He's splashed with blood. Uh, not exactly like the comedian's button. Not exactly like how Rorschach was back in the comic book. Uh, but it definitely seems like uh, the indication that I took is he's dirty in some way. He's been marred. Yeah, and also he is damaged just enough to look like he went through something for the cameras. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And then, uh, like you said, Lori goes to the crypt, finds Angela in there with the night owl glasses, or if they are night owl glasses. Uh, She's been exploring the hole. They have a quick conversation about how they don't understand how the 7th Cavalry dug that hole so quickly, which to me indicates that they did not dig dig it quickly at all. And in fact, this whole thing has been pre-planned. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, and then Lori turns around the conversation on her and basically lays down the law and explains how she's going to be in charge here. She's going to take her down. She, uh, is the big bad, uh, and can do is Angela has no power. And there is, one of the best reactions I have ever seen on TV here, where <sighs> it just holds on Regina King for a while. You don't know what her reaction is. And then she just does this very quick fainting gesture where she goes, oh, and that's it. Yeah. That's her, basically her whole answer. She pours the coffee in the hole. Incredible. And, yeah. Just like. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was it was funny. It was so specific and different than anything you see. Yeah. Uh, and then the other shot that's really interesting in there uh, is after she pours the coffee and immediately walks out, you see Lori through the glasses. And my interpretation of that, because we know their x-ray glasses, is Angela saw right through her. Like, yeah, that it's great. This whole rivalry that they're setting up between Laura and Lori and Angela is great. Uh, they're so good together. I'm very excited to see them spar going forward. Yeah. It feels like that's going to be a focus, but it also feels like they could work together at some point. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think ultimately, (coughs) even if they have different methods, they're probably on the same side of this, whatever is going on. Yeah. Or being manipulated as part of it. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, and then we met, as we mentioned, she sleeps with Petey. Um, she goes to the Dr. Manhattan call booth and then we get this joke, which I know we waited until the end to talk about, but we definitely should talk about, uh, what'd you take away from that, Justin? Well, it's interesting. So she tells a, a joke about a bricklayer and a bricklayer's daughter and um, fails, sort of fails there. She says that it ends with there's one brick left over and they throw it. she throws it in the air, the bricklayer's daughter. Um, and then she has a new joke where these three heroes die and they're at the pearly gates. Um, the first one is Owl Man. And uh, how many, uh, God asks, how many heroes did you kill? He says, none. God sends him to hell. Second, Ozymandias tells a squid story. I kill all these people, sends him to hell. Uh, Hero three is Dr. Manhattan. Uh, He says, I'm beyond all this moral shit. Also sent to hell. Uh, I thought that those, I thought this was so great. So Watchmen, the comic to bring it here. And it, it made me think all these characters are in hell. Yeah. Like Owlman is in jail 
with all the people he has locked up over the years as a hero. He's a in the comic, he's the hero who like loved being a hero the most. Like the, especially the 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 title of it or the the power and the role he had. And then he's reduced to nothing. Ozymandias, if what we were talking about comes true, he's in hell. He's lost his mental uh, prowess, and he is trapped somewhere trying to escape by pushing these clones into space. Into space. And Doc Manhattan, Dr. Manhattan, is in. he's isolated himself on Mars. He's in hell because he has seemingly he has nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we move into the end of the joke, and it turns out that the fourth person is um, the bricklayer's daughter, uh, who is, I guess, Silk Spectre as well. And uh, the brick falls out of the sky, kills God, and he goes to hell. Yeah. What'd you, what'd you take away from this, Justin? Uh, well, the first three parts, I was like, cool, great, love the take there. This last bit made me, Laurie spends the whole episode being very cool. Then uh, Angela, at the end, sees through her and knocks her down. And then this joke feels like it's over uh, she's a little bit over her skis she's like i'm a badass i killed god i win in the end end of joke and it, i think that, to me it pointed out her flaw hmm. uh where she is like i have all this darkness around me i'm i will shoot first ask questions later when really and she's crying as she's talking to dr manhattan because she's so lonely without him she has this huge hole in her heart that she just can't fill with any of this rest of her life. So I think the end of this joke was meant to build her up and then totally expose her at the very end. Mm. Yeah, I I can see that interpretation. I think I I was mainly distracted by the fact that I was annoyed at myself for not picking up on the brick joke, which this is a very different take on it, but that is a classic joke. And the fact that I they got me at the end of the episode, I was like, oh, God damn it. Oh, I'm bad. Wow. I was just bad at myself. Wow. You know, I felt, well, I, don't know. I felt like I you, got hit by a brick. Yeah. You not getting the joke is maybe not a big clue for the future. <laughs> uh, hmm. Maybe, though. I don't know. I think, I think they're going to work that into the show somehow. I'm pretty confident. Yeah, may, maybe it's a pattern that you might not get something Ooh. else later on. Yeah. Well, I, I do think it could potentially also indicate something in terms of how they're going to heighten the stakes here and uh, that it's not going to be literally killing God, but killing God in some way. It's also fascinating to me because my expectation when I was hearing the joke was, okay, God is Dr. Manhattan until she gets the third part of the joke. And it turns out she talks about the big blue guy uh, who is Dr. Manhattan. And he also goes to hell. Um, So I don't know. I mean, part of it also might be that she regrets this pact that they made the four of them. Maybe, maybe God is Rorschach. The only one that stayed true to himself the entire time. Yeah. I don't know because that is all of the other characters who are in Karnak who made this pact, who decided we are not going to reveal what happened with the squid. We are never going to tell that because that would disrupt the ultimate peace in the world. Um, And Rorschach was the only one, if you haven't read the book, Rorschach was the only one that disagreed. He was ultimately killed by Dr. Manhattan. Uh, If I want to go back to that murder board, maybe that indicates why her door number was 406, because that's the moment that she keeps going back to and keeps thinking about her entire life. Yeah, that's interesting. It's also weird that uh, that God's main question was how many people did you kill? Yeah, that maybe indicates Rorschach a little bit. Not that he was obsessed with. No, but he was he was morally black and white. He didn't see any yeah. gradations where, like we've been talking about, everybody else does, and everybody else understands that they're there. So I don't know. I'm not totally convinced of this God is Rorschach and this joke thing, but I'm also just not sure exactly what it is. Yeah, uh, but uh, so and a couple of other things happen here. So she um, she's very upset. She's sort of asking for a sign from Doctor Manhattan. She walks out of the uh, Mars booth, and a car drops onto the ground right in front of her. She looks up, sees a little blinking red Mars, 
and starts laughing. Yeah. What's, what's happening here? Well, I think a couple of things are happening. I mean, it's possible that Dr. Renat dropped a car on her, certainly. Uh, it's possible. Seems like a weird love note. Well, that's, I took it as he, it's the brick. It's the brick falling down at the end. Like, it's the same yeah. sort of thing. Uh, but I also, I think it's. But why not use a brick? I don't know. Well, I think it's Angela's car, right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I think it was the same car. So I think it's her car falling down, but I think she starts laughing because, A, her joke is not funny. Like any of the comedian's jokes, it's not a laugh-out-loud funny joke. And I think at the very least, she sees it as Dr. Manhattan giving his own version of the punchline of the brick dropping down, which is a yes. car falling from Mars. And that's what makes her laugh. Yeah, that that's what I think too. But obviously it wasn't that. It was the owl ship or whatever that got Will is dropping the car. Right. And I, I, but she doesn't know that yet. I think there's her interpretation right. of events and that's why it happens to her. But uh, we may find out something different in the future. Uh, the Dr. Manhattan thing is weird to me, though, because I still don't totally believe he's on Mars. And I think all of these lady true Dr. Manhattan calling booths are like, spoiler, writing letters to Santa Claus. Santa Claus does not exist, podcast listeners. So your letters are wow. going fucking nowhere. No, they still go to the Antarctic. To the North Pole. Antarctica. He's a penguin. Sorry. Yeah. I hope. I, yeah, I write letter, letters to the South Pole. Yeah. Uh, I write them to the present penguin. Yeah. What? Uh, the present penguin. Who do, the penguin who delivers presents. Ah, uh, yes. You know that. Of course. I know what you mean. Yeah. That's uh, one of those, like uh, Norway, is, it's not a Santa. It's Sinterklausen is a penguin. <laughs> exactly. Like uh, Krampus. So, yeah, we do get that end mode. Is there anything else you want to discuss from the episode? No, I mean, we really covered uh, most of it, I think. Yeah. Um, Great episode. I'm very excited to see how this continues going forward now that we have Lori in the mix and the rest of the Watchmen characters. I'm curious to see whether also this Adrian Veidt reveal, is that going to turn out to be a double blithe? There's a part of me that still buys into our theories of maybe he's Dr. Manhattan. Why were they being so yeah. cagey about it? But uh, very cool. Good good stuff. Good show. Good stuff. Good what a, stuff. That's how we end the episode. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, now, we are going to have another bonus episode of this podcast, which will roll out Thursday, only in the Watchmen Watch feed. So do go subscribe over there, uh, where we'll talk about the promo for the next episode. We'll talk about your theories and questions and comments. So definitely hit us up on Twitter, Watchmen Watch One, with any of those. We'll roll out a tweet that you can respond to, and we'll read some of those in the next episode. Uh, you can support us on patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. at the People's Improv Theater Loft in New York. Come on by. We'll chat with you about Watchmen. Also, Watchmen Watch podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Follow those for pictures and news and, you know, cool things like that. And remember, we taped this podcast 35 minutes ago. Also, 35 minutes ago, I launched my giant blue dildo company. So hit oh, me up. I threw a brick in the air. <laughs>